what I've learned is every leader is a bit different, right? They have their skill set, they have their the things that they really like to do. And I was, I always felt I wasn't really good at running the company. And, and it might be strange, but I, I could be good at the strategic, the vision, the ideas of where we should go, but the day to day running it, you know, making sure we're executing well operationally. And, you know, I was never really strong at that. And I fought it for a long time where I thought, man, I got to be really good at this. I got to get good at this. And, and I just learned through, uh, through YPO, through, uh, you know, I, I do have a CEO coach and, and really talking about, you know, what I really love to do and felt that I was good at. And what was the saying? Like, don't try to turn a weakness into a strength, you know, like, maybe in school or something you have to do that but once you're in a business you know really do more of what you're great at and don't do much of what you're not great at so i, I learned that and and then i realized you know i don't really enjoy running the business day to day because i didn't think i was particularly good at it and and then i bring in i brought in leaders that are just amazing at running a business uh, executing holding people accountable and uh, and i can focus more on the future and uh, that's been wonderful and, and it's been a challenge, but it's been super exciting and, and wonderful. Hello and welcome to Marketing Speak. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer. It's my pleasure to have Graham Robbins with us. Graham is executive chairman of a a Customs Brokers and the founder and executive chairman of Border Buddy, which is digitizing the customs clearance process into the USA and Canada for carriers, digital platforms, importers, exporters, and customs brokers. Graham is active in the Young Presidents Organization, or YPO, and he is, in fact, uh, just finished up his chairmanship role of the British Columbia chapter. He's also host of the Graham Robbins podcast, but most importantly, he's a former client of mine. And we're gonna go behind the scenes on some of the initiatives we've implemented for borderbuddy.com. Graham, it's so great to have you on the show. Thanks a lot, it's great to see you again. It's great to be here. Yeah, so uh, let's start with your origin story, if you will. Uh, how did you get into the customs brokerage world? Customs Brokers World uh, came to me through my family. So my my dad and mom started a and Customs Brokers in 1979. And I was lucky enough to be born into that and started full time myself in uh, 20. Sorry, I was going to say 20. It's 1991. Been there for quite a while now. Wow. <laughs> so you left high school and immediately started working for your parents then. Right. And even before that, I was working summers and things like that. Uh, weekends and summers before that, but yeah, full-time right, right out of high school. <laughs> awesome. And you ended up creating this uh, uh, adjunct or, or sister company to a and called Border Buddy. What was the inspiration for that and what problem were you trying to solve? Yes. Yeah, so Border Buddy still services, you know, this uh, is the same service as a and customs clearance but two very different cu uh, customer segments. I actually learned about this at a case study I did once, but um, you know, basically we, a and a, a and A's core customer is a large business shipping hundreds or thousands of shipments per month, repeat. They're used to credit terms and, you know, purchase orders and things like that. It's a typical business. And the border buddy side, what happened is when e-commerce started really coming on, you know, 15 years ago, you were getting our, our switchboard lit up by customers asking, I want to import a pair of shoes or I want to import a car or a pizza oven, just smaller items. And they were kind of clogging up our core customer service and still great customers, but very different needs. They, they needed more education, more uh, knowledge transfer, things like that. And so we spun out Border Buddy uh, fully, actually. We, we operated inside of a a for a number of years and then we fully uh, spun it out in 2018. And how long have you been in YPO and, and what was the impetus for joining that organization? Okay. So I've been in YPO since 2008. So that's going on 16 years, I guess. And the impetus for joining, I was a member of a group called the Canadian Association of Family Enterprise or CAFE, which was a learning group. And the, uh, YPO was recommended to me through that. So it was a group uh, that recommended 
you know, more peer learning, peer experience. I was looking for some help in growing the business and scaling the business. A lot of issues that I didn't have a lot of peers at the time that I could turn to. And so YPO has been amazing for me with the, the learning, the learning about myself, learning about my business, how to be a better leader, father, son, husband, everything like that. And so it's just been, I've gone all in on YPO. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. And have you done other programs like Strategic Coach, for example, or is YPO really the, the main thing? Yeah, YPO is the main thing for me. I, I, I was doing a bunch of other things at the beginning, and then I just realized how deep and broad YPO was. You can, there's just a choose your own adventure through the whole YPO journey where you can, you know, you can do things at a chapter level, which is in your city or town or province or state. Then there's regional, which is a bigger chunk. And then there's international. It just kind of goes and goes. And there's all sorts of programs and education for whatever you're looking for. Cool. And do you present there as well as run the, well, you used to run the chapter in British Columbia, but do you uh, present at their big conferences or anything like that? I haven't done that. I put on events. So we, you know, YPO is completely member run, right? There's a, the, everything is run by the members. So uh, when you're a member, you're expected to, you know, champion events, put on events and, and do speeches and, or there's a bunch of different uh, journeys you can go on there, but I got involved in the executive. So running the local chapter, YPO British Columbia, which has about 110 members and did everything on that chapter except finance pretty much. So, you know, forum, uh, learning officer putting all putting on you know twenty to thirty events a year, and then uh, and then chapter chair. So, uh, but a lot of the times when they bring in, they'll bring in speakers, and that could be a YPO member or an, an external resource to to speak at the conferences and things like that. Gotcha. And and as far as scaling the business, you've really done well with both businesses, scaling those to the point where you're no longer running either one. So do you want to share some of the uh, results of that, some of the secrets to uh, making that successful? Yeah, you know, what I've learned is every leader is a bit different, right? They have their skill set. They have their the things that they really like to do. And I was I always felt I wasn't really good at running the company. And, and it might be strange, but I, I could be good at the strategic, the vision, the ideas of where we should go, but the day-to-day -day running it, you know, making sure we're executing well operationally. And, you know, I was never really strong at that. And I fought it for a long time where I thought, man, I got to be really good at this. I got to get good at this. And, and I just learned through, uh, through YPO, through, uh, you know, I, I do have a CEO coach and, and really talking about, you know, what I really love to do and felt that I was good at. And what was the saying? Like, don't try to turn a weakness into a strength, you know, like maybe in school or something, you have to do that. But once you're in a business, you know, really do more of what you're great at and don't do much of what you're not great at. So I, I learned that. And, and then I realized, you know, I don't really enjoy running the business day to day because I didn't think I was particularly good at it. And, and then I bring in, I brought in leaders that are just amazing at running a business, uh, executing, holding people accountable, and uh, and I can focus more on the future, and uh, that's been wonderful. And and it's been a challenge, but it's been super exciting and and wonderful. Right. And to use EOS parlance, you're a visionary, not an integrator. Yeah, I think I learned that, and and it's hard to say that in a weird, in a way like you call you label yourself a visionary or something like that. But I definitely not. A strong integrator and the visionary part is something that excites me and and i get i get excited about newness and ideas and thinking on, on, about what we could do what our possibilities are so that's definitely my my favorite spot <laughs> yeah and and you're uh someone who's implemented eos entrepreneurial operating system which we've uh, talked about on on other episodes on this uh, podcast so what made you uh, want to implement EOS and what value did you get out of, uh, out of EOS? Like, what's, uh, what are some of the highlights? 
Well, what I've learned about my personality is even though I can, I can be in this sort of idea space and, you know, I love whiteboarding and brainstorming things like that. I also really love frameworks in my life. I love frameworks. I love systems and processes to follow. And, and so, you know, it could be everything from, you know, the love languages in, in my personal life. Like I, I, I like, I like those frameworks. And so when EOS came, came about, it was really like a paint by number, you know, process or system that not only I could follow, but I realized the easier I make it for the rest of the people in our company to follow, the more aligned we could get. And back to my, my, some of my weaknesses, some of my weaknesses were, you know, getting people aligned and getting them on board. And once we put in EOS, it was a lot, it was amazing because we were just talking the same language. We were all focused on the same goals every, you know, day, week, month, quarter, year. And that brought a huge amount of value to me. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of joke, like I couldn't be in a, if I'm in a leadership meeting, I, I, I just can't not have that in my meeting anymore. I just, it becomes like, you know, the best way I describe it is it's like your iPhone. It's like, if you had to go back to a Nokia and, and the, you know, press three letters to text somebody or something like it, the, the operating system that you use is, is become second nature. And so it just, it was super helpful to me and, uh, brought a lot, brought a lot of issues to light, which was great. And you learned about EOS from what YPO? You, interestingly, it was an evolution from scaling up, which is scaling up is, uh, Vern Harnish and, uh, started with that. That was a YPO event in Alberta. Actually, we brought in Vern and then had a group, uh, a, a meeting with YPO British Columbia, YPO Alberta. And there, that was an aha moment for me. And that was over a decade ago where it was, oh my gosh. Yeah. Th I need rocks. I need, you know, I, I need the one page plan. I don't need a 27 page booklet on that, you know, and, and all the terminology I've heard since then, you know, if, if you're, strategic plan needs to be bound. It's not a plan. You know, if it makes a thud when it drops onto a desk, it's not a plan because no one's going to look at it or follow it. So the simplicity uh, started with scaling up. And then what I found at the time going back to framework and how do I get the person that starts on Monday, the new person that's starting with our company on Monday, how do I ramp them up as fast as possible? And it was my opinion that EOS had simpler tools that were, you know, we give, we give every new hire a what the heck is EOS book. Here's what EOS is all about. And they're off to the races pretty quickly. And so that, I think the marketing and the framework side of it was a bit stronger at the time with EOS. I've since seen that, that scaling up has really doubled down on that and they've got software and a whole bunch of other things that they've developed over the last decade. Right. And then the weekly meetings, uh, what, what are those called? In, in EOS, that's an yeah. L10. L10, yeah, level 10, level 10 meetings. Yeah. So you have all right. your executive uh, team on that and it's a strict time schedule with uh, things like sharing wins and going through uh, what, what was not to do's, but issues. Right. So it's, it's start, you know, start on time, end on time. It's 90 minutes. It's, you always have a personal segue at the beginning where we're all sharing wins personally and, and, and professionally. You've got a scorecard to check all your metrics. You are doing any people headlines, like just nothing that you have to solve, but hey, so-and-so is going to have a baby. So-and-so's, you know, going to be off on a holiday uh, in a week or two. That's just, uh, you know, updates to the company. Then there are rocks. Let's, what are we working on? For this quarter, we'll just check in on those. How are we doing? Then there's to dos, all the things we said we would do. Probably my favorite part, because uh, you know, personal accountability is is a big issue for me, and I think it's important. And I just love that when you leave that meeting, all your to dos are tracked, and they're going to be there in the next meeting. And you either did them or you didn't, right? And so that's a real indicator of how people perform. And then yeah, then you go through the to dos, and it's next and we'll see you in seven days and ideally no meetings in between no like meetings after the meeting hey if if we have our meeting on monday and you ask me something on wednesday i'll go can it wait till the monday meeting you know and and that allows people to really stay out of kind of meeting hell and and be more you know productive and working on their on their rocks and most things can wait 
seven days. It's, it's amazing what happens when you get that discipline in. I, I don't want to have seven meetings a week on uh, various issues. We can talk about it at the L10. Yeah, amazing. And now you're just an executive chairman, so you're not in any of those kinds of meetings. In fact, I don't even know if uh, they're still doing level 10 meetings and implementing EOS. I think you said something about uh, the, your CEOs have complete autonomy to implement whatever frameworks and systems and uh, vendor relationships they want. Absolutely. And so, you know, going back to, I could talk about YPO a lot, but, you know, going back to YPO, when I was hiring CEOs to run the businesses, I would ask a lot of people that have a done that, you know, you've hired CEOs for your companies. How did that work? And then almost more importantly, talk to CEOs who are hired guns that have worked for somebody else. And those were the most fun conversations. I said, how do I not be a jerk CEO, like a jerk owner? Like, how do I not be, I want to be a really good owner and I want you to be a really great CEO. And everything I heard time and time again was, <laughs> I don't think, I, I don't know if you have swearing on this podcast, but it was like, it, it was like, you know, everything from shut your hole, know your role. Like you are not the CEO you know, there's a CEO in place and you don't tell that person what to do. You barely answer questions because they're doing all the thinking. And I'm not going to tell them to run EOS, run scaling up. Uh, I, I will have some mandates on what we want the business to do. And actually, in most cases, they're giving the plan of what they want the business to do. And I'm not telling them how to do that. So I, I really believe in the autonomy and ownership and I don't, I don't think either of them are running US anymore and I don't ask them, you know, I don't, Hey, how do you run your meetings? I, I don't, you know, I don't, it's not that I don't care. It's that, that they should do what they feel is best to get the results that they want. Well, congratulations and all the freedom. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a big change, but uh, it's been really invigorating. And I think what I've noticed is the people benefit the most from it because you know, I, I sort of joke, like if I, maybe this is too much, but if, if I didn't own that company, I probably would have been fired as CEO because I wasn't a particularly good CEO. Uh, I was, I was good when I was in the business a bit. And then, so in EOS, it actually talks about that. Like if you can't do that role, even if you own the company, you can't sit there because you're holding everyone else accountable for finance and HR and sales, but you can't, you can't be not doing your job very well. Uh, it's unfair to the company. So that I realized that, that, hey, I, I need to remove myself because I don't think I'm the strongest person for this company. So it's better for the people too. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's actually a great way of saying it. Like I, I, I probably put myself down a bit too much because the, the business have ha, businesses have done well, uh, but I think there could be more growth and more opportunities for for the people there. You know, people development and things like that. And I'm super excited for the teams that are there to get that with with even stronger leadership to take, yeah, like you said, steroids or take it to a new level that, you know, and even Amazon jokes about this, like you should be bringing on people at all, at all times that are better, that are always raising the bar. And I think Jeff Bezos said it, that says, you know, you should look ahead and in five years, you should be able to say, you know, I would never get hired here again. <laughs> like, I'm so lucky to be on this team. They would never hire me now because the people and everything has gotten so much better in that company that you've just brought on better and better people to make the company better and better. Yeah. Okay. But still, I think you'd make Gino Wickman proud <laughs> if you told him your story. Uh, Gino Wickman, by the way, for the listener is the founder of EOS entrepreneurial operating system, a former guest, by the way, uh, an amazing guest. That was a great episode. <laughs> 
Yeah, Gino's great, and and I've seen a lot of him, and and I think definitely I would say that EOS has a system like that helped me get there because it it um, you know it, it it puts those that process into the company that can kind of get it running without you. Like I never felt ever, yeah, even 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 before US, but but more so after US, I never felt that the company needed me. It, it was like, no, the, we know who's responsible and accountable with this accountability chart. We know who needs to do that role. I, I could take vacation and have my weekends and nights. And, you know, that there was never an issue where I, it was like, oh, if I got hit by a bus, the company's going to fall apart. You know, it, that, I never felt that. Yeah, got it. Well, let's talk a bit about some of the initiatives that uh, we pushed through on borderbuddy.com and what a difference uh, that was from the former version of the website before we started working together, which I remember was the whole thing was a bright orange, including the background. And there were maybe five pages uh, and the about page wasn't about the company. It was about... I don't know what the, it wasn't it, it, like, it didn't give any background uh, uh, on you or the, the, the company. It was like or, a contact us page, right? You know, <laughs> it's like it's a, where to, where like to find us. us. Yeah. It was, yeah. it was um, uh, a starter. Let's just say a starter website. <laughs> yeah. And we completely transformed that. And uh, it's still the same. I, I just looked at it before we uh, started recording. It looks the same from uh, when we left it, when when we stopped working together, that uh, site hasn't undergone any kind of uh, overhaul in terms of design or uh, conversion or SEO, it looks like. Right. Yeah. So when, when we first started working with you, we basically had one of the key things about Border Buddy was it, it's an on, it has an online tool that is a calculator, which sounds simple, but when you're talking about customs, we need to apply tariff classification, tax codes, which are different, by the way, by every province, every province in Canada and then into the U.S. has taxes and there's excise tax and things like that. So it's not just like, you know, what's four times five and here's my calculation. It's what's that product? What's the origin of it? By the way, the country of origin has a different duty rate from the U.S. versus China, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very complicated piece. And so when we first launched the website, it was basically, you know, we had the tool there to, to do the calculations and then we had Google ads to get people to the tool. So that was really, that was really the website. So it was like you said, two, two to five pages. And, and then when you helped us, you know, look at SEO, look at, you know, the, the brand identity. Yeah. It was all orange. We had people complain about that. They'd go on and, Man, it's just a sea of orange and we wanted to stand out because there's so many companies that are blue and you know they're, they're like blue is huge for some reason blue and red are just massive and so orange was was fairly unique and we wanted to stand out a bit uh, having said that we you know once once you started helping us with content and blog posts and we had going back to us we had kpis showing like how much we wanted to move from uh from paid to organic and we saw huge increases in that, you know, just, just huge increases in developing great content that was uh, really helpful to importers and exporters driving content to our, to our page. And then ideally getting a quote and, and us completing the service. So that was a fun, fun journey. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what made it more interesting, let's just say interesting. <laughs> I don't know what other word to use right now, but um during the pandemic, it uh, really disrupted import export, and uh, we were working together when it just started. So we came, we uh, really moved quickly and put together a huge uh, kind of strategy and and set of content pieces and so forth around the. Uh, coronavirus and COVID and what uh, importers need to know about it. And uh, actually wrote so much about it that we turned it into an ebook. Uh, so a PDF download and we had things like uh, uh, infographics and 
Yeah, lots of uh, really meaty, valuable stuff. And because it came out so quickly, I think in maybe April of 2020, we put that out. I think our first version of the uh, of the article came out in March, in fact, and then the 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 big uh, ebook came out a month later or something like that in, in April. So we moved pretty fast, and I think that was a that was a significant differentiator for you guys versus the other uh, customs brokerage uh, services out in the uh, in in your space. Absolutely, and and it's funny you just triggered some re- uh, memories there because. Uh, you know, for your audience, we Border Buddy and ANA both do shipments into Canada and the U.S., right? So we are licensed on both countries. But what happened with a border shutdown is, you know, there's a stat that 90% of Canadians live within 100 miles of the border. So what a lot of Canadians do is when they're buying things or shopping online, et cetera, they will drive down to the U.S. You know, for me, the border is about 17 minutes from my office. Sorry, sorry, from my house, about 17 minutes from my house. So if someone doesn't ship to Canada, there's these mailbox companies littered across the northern border from, you know, from Washington state all the way over to New York that have parcels delivered to them. And so people go down on the weekend after hours, these things are open 24 hours. They go down and get their Amazon packages or whatever packages they are, and they self-declare. So they say, hey, I I bought a computer or whatever they bought, Uh, but they couldn't do that anymore. So all their products were being shipped to the U S and they couldn't cross the border because the border was shut down. So yeah, our business went bonkers. Our phones lit up and emails lit up and, and we had very specific wording and, and uh, helpful articles on there about, you know, what their options are and how to deal with it. And, and that was a really, you know, it was a, a lame time for Canadians trying to cross the border, but it was really great that we had a solution. We had people that, you know, you've heard about all the, the COVID spikes in, in, in um, certain industries, but I mean, kayaking, stand-up paddle boarding, canoes, sea dues, boats. You know, we were importing all those when people were like, I was going to have that shipped to the U.S., but you can help me do it directly. And so we were doing a lot of that work uh, and still do because people realize it's actually not that expensive to stop driving down and on your own and you can just have it delivered to your door. So we set up a lot of that based on that content and and that, uh, you know, timing. Yeah. And, and we were your content department. We were writing all your articles and all the web, web content for everything from the about page to the import export page and the frequently asked questions, all of it. Yeah. Blog. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, you know, I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's almost comical about how, how much that content drives, uh, visits, you know, and people are like, oh, like, we got to do content. We got to do content. But when you're following EOS and you've got the KPIs, we had like two main, we had two main KPIs that were fun to watch. How many blog posts did you do? And what's the organic traffic? If we d- didn't do blog posts, we got no organic traffic. If we if we did blog posts regularly, our organic traffic went up. It's just super simple, but it's a long game that not a lot of people are. You know, it's like, oh, we're going to do 10 blog posts and then they stop. But uh, you have to keep at it. And the content just kind of the, the the traffic ends up snowballing. Yeah. And it's it's important also to have evergreen pages, not just blog posts that are you know, of the moment, like here's what you need to know about uh, import, export and uh, COVID, you know, with COVID-19 restrictions this month or something but something specific to importing a car, not just an import export page, but import a car, import a horse, import into Canada, export out of Canada to the US. These sorts of pages are essential so that you can rank for those specialized, more uh, niche terms. Completely agree. And, and, you know, I'll ask people sometimes like, what do you think are most visited pages, you know? And, and, you know, after the calculator, which is our still our most visited page, but it's shocking because there'll be a little niche item inside of importing a car. So there'll be importing a vehicle and then there'll be like, there's a bunch of documents and things that you need to do. And inside of that is one of our most visited pages. And that's an evergreen piece. I think you, I think you guys wrote it actually. And, um, and, and it's amazing because it just, it's like, a 
I think you might have said it. Every is it every blog post and every evergreen content is a sales rep. Well, wow. once you, I think once you said it to me, my eyes kind of lit up. I was like, oh my gosh, he's right. Like every question in your industry should be a page on your on your website, and it, whether it's blog or evergreen or whatever, video, link to your podcast about it, whatever it is, and it is pretty surprising what you don't. It's just happening in the background until you look in your Google Analytics and go, wow, you know, that page is is one of our most important pages to potential customers. Yeah. And do you remember at the beginning of this whole process, we did a brand script for you. So we implemented the story brand framework and uh, SB7, and we came up with the internal problem for your audience. We came up with the shared villain, the uh, process plan, the agreement plan. So in, in story brand, you typically go with a process plan, sometimes an agreement plan, but almost never both. So I think it's uh, in the book that Donald, uh, the book called Building a Story Brand, where Donald Miller said that about 70% of the time folks go with a process plan and, and 30% with an agreement plan. Well, I figured why not do both? <laughs> so, so we did. And on the about page is your uh, agreement plan, which is we treat customers the way we'd like to be treated. Uh, keep it simple, leave the math to us, and change is good. And then a little bit of verbiage underneath each. And then in the import export section is the process plan, which is a simple four step process. Get a quote, no, step one, get a quote in seconds using our handy customs calculator. Step two, you send us the invoice. Step three, you pay us. Step four, you relax as we prepare your documents for import. And it just makes it so simple sounding for a potential customer to say yes to and, and makes it seem like you're uh, a, a company that does what it says it's going to do to have an agreement plan, to have those commitments laid out for folks that you know, it's almost like uh, your you know, co company values. Yes. And, and it's, um, it's funny being refreshed on this right now because we've kind of closed the loop on that too. And what we've, what we've done is we've really focused on our Google reviews and we have the most Google reviews for any customs broker in the world. And by the way, I challenge anyone on the podcast, if I'm wrong, please tell me who it is. We look and we can't find anyone and we're, we're sort of, we're probably five to eight X anyone else. And what we what we do, and what's fascinating is that simplicity that you talked about. Every Google review that we get that's positive, that's four and above, we ping into a Slack channel to our ops team. So that thing on the website that you just described, that you know, with our customer promise, basically, or however you want to word it, um, it's amazing what happens in this in the Slack channel with the reviews coming in. They're going. They made it seamless. I was so scared. I thought I thought this was going to be a brutal process. Uh, they made it so easy. And then it's like a self-fulfilling positivity loop to our people that set, that shows, oh, the customers do care about this. And they 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 were doing what we said we would do. And you can just see from the views, like, why would I do anything other than what these customers are raving about? Like they made it easy, they answered my call, they returned my email quickly, like all the things that you want to do. And then anything that's below, because we're not perfect, anything that's below a four star goes just to the leadership team. So actually, and we're not tricking anyone. You can go on our website, you can go on Google reviews and see all the reviews, but our ops people never see the negative. And it's kind of fun because our leadership team goes, you know, okay, you got a one star review because you took two days to, re to return an email. Someone deleted or got lost or something weird happened. So then we go and fix that and make sure that that gets, you know, fixed. But the positivity of that, of those constant four or five star reviews tells our people again and again, like, this is what they care about. This is our customer's love language, basically, you know? And so, so like keep doing it and it's, it's really gratifying. Yeah. I remember we interviewed, I interviewed you to extract all the about page content from you because none of it was documented anywhere. There were a couple of little tidbits that I was able to uh, to get from docu internal documentation because I, I, I know a, a bit about EOS that you have the uh, 
the vision, core values, those sorts of things documented in a, uh, what is it? A vision mission planner or something like that? V the VTO for EOS? Yeah, vision traction organizer. Yeah. So I was able to get those items from you for the about page. And then the rest of it, like the timeline of the history, the evolution of Border Buddy, I interviewed you for, and then we took that recording and um, turned that into content and got got that uh, visually designed. By the way, our partner for all the design stuff is Studio One Design, Greg Merrilies, who's amazing, good friend of mine and past guest on this podcast, uh, was pivotal in you know the the visual. Uh, conversion focused design that came out of uh, the, our our work together, but yeah, this this is it brings back memories here to uh, recall all the stuff that we did together to bring about you know something out of nothing and to to end up with I don't know ten or twenty times more content than we had when we started and when we were not experts at all <laughs> in the import export world. Uh, yeah, that was, that was a challenge. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I actually remember seeing some of the blog posts and I was editing them at, at the beginning or, or reviewing them. And I was like, wow, like I don't have to touch this one. It's really good. And, and so you guys, the content people are great. And it, it's interesting you say that about the about us page, because I will admit I, I undervalued that at the beginning. I obviously, because we didn't have one before, but I, I, cause personally, I don't care that much about that on other, for other people. Like. I don't, if somebody goes and says, well, we'd be in a business for 52 years. Like, I'm like, I don't care. Like Snapchat's being in business for like four years, you know, and like, who cares that you'd be in a business for 50 years or hundred years? Like, I actually don't care about that. I want to know, can you do the service in the way that I want and the way that I like, and, um, is it a reasonable price? And then I'm going to go. Uh, but what I realized is once you start telling what you're about, people do resonate and care about that, you know? And so that, that's a visited page. And there used to be a, because we were a calculator page, there, if you searched, if you searched border buddy, it was like, um, what, one of the things was like, is, is border buddy real? Like, is it, is it actually a real business? Because is this just a calculator page that spits out things and, or is it, can you actually do what it says it will do? So that helped also round out our content to say, to build some trust. Like, yeah, not only are Google reviews are here and I even asked people say, are those scam reviews? Like, are you paying somebody to get to do those reviews? And we absolutely never have and never would. Um, but so you, you can't really trust the Google reviews and some people, cause you, you can, people can hire people to, to get, give you good reviews. But then once the about us page was there and then we have pictures of our actual employees, it was a big thing for me. No stock images of fake people that look like models. Like we all look how we look like real people. And so like, let's, let's, um, you know, make sure we put a face to a name there. And, and actually that's another thing that comes across in our Google reviews is they name the people a lot. Oh, I worked with Blair or Katrina or Jeff or whoever it was that and they were awesome to work with and they were fantastic. They held my hand and helped me. And so that about us page, uh, you know, was something I undervalued, but I know that people look at it and, and care, like, who am I dealing with here? You know, where are they? What, you know, what are they about? Yeah, it's a, it adds legitimacy and people do business with people, you know, it's human to human. So if they can uh, relate to you, if they can know, like, and trust you because of your story, your uh, scrappy, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, out of nothing creation of border buddy and and uh how successful that's gotten and and your connections to ypo and and in your passion for things like eos and uh also kpi checklists that was another thing that we um learned from you that uh, you implemented we put that on the timeline as one of the milestones when you implemented that uh the book by bernie smith and the whole system around that yeah, Bernie is great. I, we use his stuff every day. So it's amazing. So lots of great, great stuff. And I think just um, your core focus that's on that page sums up your ethos and the business and how it is different from everybody else. Our passion is to deliver awesome. 
in all caps. <laughs> Our point of difference is that we simplify customs brokerage. That just uh, encapsulates so much in just a handful of words. I'll give you, I give credit to Joey Gibbons. He's a YPO friend of mine. And, and I, I just was asking him because he's got a really great brand. He runs Gibbons Hospitality in Whistler and sort of, you know, has an amazing brand identity up there. And, and I asked him, he doesn't really know anything about customs brokerage, but we've imported things for him, for him. And he goes, all I know is you like, you deliver awesome. He's like, I ordered something online. And it was a big pain in the butt. Someone's like, oh, how do I get this across the border? You need a customs broker. He goes, I just emailed you guys the invoice and it was done. And we, and so I stole that from him. I give him credit for the awesome part. But the second part was that was really fun is, you know, our business tends to be technical. And what I noticed is there's a habit to flex that to people like, oh, this is technical. We're the experts and here's all this knowledge and stuff we have. What we realize our customers don't care about any of that. There might be a percentage that do, but the vast majority of our customers, they don't want us to give them knowledge. They want their shipment delivered like yesterday, you know? So if that happens, they're happy. They don't want to know that we had to apply to tariff classification and our, all our people need to be licensed and qualified to do that. And, you know, they're just like, I don't know, just did it show up at my door? It does <laughs> work. You know, <laughs> yeah. And they, they, you know, they want to be compliant and not making sure that we're not breaking the law and things like that, but really they don't. And so many times you'll get on with people and they'll start telling you the intricacies of, it's like when you order a steak at, at a restaurant, like, they don't tell you that, okay, we're going to, you know, put some oil on the grill and we're going to light it at 325 and then we're going to flip it after two minutes. Like, who cares? Did my, was my steak medium rare or not? You know, like I'm good. So I, I think that was really fun is, is getting our people to realize that even though we are very knowledgeable and experienced and licensed, our customers actually don't want to hear a lot about that. But if you have that on your page and you have that on your content, the people that do care about it will find it and, and learn that but they just want it delivered. <laughs> yeah. So I know we're, we're uh, running out of time here. Do, do you want to share any kind of nugget of wisdom or anything that stands out uh, for you from our work together or any kind of uh, lesson learned? You know, I, I think there's so much that we, we covered a lot uh, today and in some ways. And I think, for me, I, I really think is understanding what you're most comfortable and, and good at doing, you know, try to go in that direction. That's not, not everyone has a lot of choice about what they can do, but if when you realize that you're really good at this and you're not so good at this, sometimes you get stuck thinking, I need to get good at that. And I actually don't believe in that. I'm like, I'm not good at that. I don't want to become good at that, but there's somebody else out there that, loves being good at that and is really good at that. So the faster you can get into your, you know, your wheelhouse or your sort of magic spot, I think the better for you and everyone around you. And so that's probably one of my biggest learnings in the last 20 years. Just get, get to that, get to that role as fast as possible. Right. And as Dan Sullivan says, uh, that gets, he's the founder of strategic coach that gets you a self managing business or even better, a self multiplying one. And it sounds like that's where you're at. You're, uh, you're kind of on autopilot. Your team's doing great and you can just go fishing. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have four kids, so there's not a lot of fishing happening unless it's with them, of course, but uh, not a ton of spare time, but absolutely. It, it, it allows me to, to think about larger things and it's been pretty wonderful. Awesome. Well, thank you, Graham. And thank you, listener. I hope you've got some great little tips there or got some at least inspiration to maybe do a revamp on your website or to do better content marketing or uh, create more pages for your um, SEO initiatives so that, uh, you know, you got more virtual salespeople out there. We'll catch you in the next episode. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off. <laughs>